Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. And it feels weird to be saying afternoon. Usually we do an 8.30 slot, so this is like... Oh, really? is, yeah, yeah, so we're usually up early. So like, it is weird to be like in the afternoon. But welcome uh, to the Marketing Meetup. It's amazing to have you all here. And it's so good to be back as well. Um, before I introduce David, I just want to take a moment to appreciate everyone that's here today. Um, everyone in our lovely little community and say that every one of you have elevated these sessions to such an unreal level. My challenge for you today, once again, is to bring that level, bring that fire into the chat feature, uh, interact with each other, don't stop, just chatting, contributing, make this special because at the end of the day, like we're here for you um, and that's truly the most important thing. So uh, yeah, don't forget to switch your chat feature to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see your messages. And uh, with your messages, I want to open up by asking you to let us know where you're watching from and in honor of today's guest, your favorite newsletter that you subscribe to. Um, on to the introduction. And for those of you who have seen my own emails about today's session, then you know that I am just a little bit excited about our, our guest today, David Hyatt. Uh, David is the co-founder of Hyatt Denim and the Do Lectures. Uh, David started his career at Saatchi and Saatchi. However, a series of events led him back to his town of Cardigan in Wales, where he and his wife Claire opened up the denim factory. Uh, that began a mission to bring back 400 jobs that had been lost in the town, some 10% of the town's population at the time. Um, that journey started and now Hyatt Denim is recognized as one of the world's greatest jeans makers and can count clientele such as Meghan Markle among the customers, which is unreal. And if you head to their website, you'll be able to see the best sort of uh, company promo video that you'll ever see in the entirety of the world, which is a 29 minute video uh, produced by Shopify about Hyatt Denim. You need to go and watch it. It's like a film. It's amazing. Um, as well as Hyatt Denim, David is also involved in the Do Lectures uh, as the co-founder of them. And the Do Lectures is a series of lectures. It's an amazing event. And the only thing that I can really say about it is that it's a pure life ambition of mine to sort of attend or at least be part of those Do Lectures in, in any way, because it is just, you need to go, you need to see, you need to see what it looks like, because honestly, it's unreal. On a more personal level, uh, there's been more than a little bit of influence provided by David to the marketing meetup. When I was figuring out my own writing style for emails, for LinkedIn, for whatever, I was truly trying to channel a bit of David. I was doing a bit of a poor parody, if I'm honest. Uh, I adapted it over the course of time, but uh, this man's influence can't be overestimated in how we communicate as a community. Moreover, the way that David uh, builds his businesses, his connections, and speaks about community, sings true to my own heart. And I know that this is something that will also resonate with everyone here today. 
I can already see there's like 563 people joined today's chat, which is just unreal. Uh, today's session is all about email marketing, and it's a channel where I've been in marketing for like eight years now or something like that. And I swear that I've seen like hundreds of emails declaring that email is dead. Um, but for me, and I know for David, it remains one of the most robust, reliable marketing channels that we have at our, at our disposal. David, we have someone who excels at the channel. And today we're gonna to try and do our best to unpack some of his processes. It's also very much worth picking up this book, uh, Do Open, uh, which is on Amazon. I think it's number seven on the PR list right now, uh, which I'll also link in the follow-up email. Uh, today runs simply as an interview, so we're going to have a nice chat. So there's plenty of time for questions and use the Q&A feature to get those in. Uh, the chat feature will hopefully be alive right now. Uh, and, and with that, then uh, with the questions are best placed in the Q&A feature. Uh, my final thing before the interview starts is just to say a big thank you to the sponsors for today. Um, those of you who have attended marketing meetup events will know that we wouldn't be able to do what we do without the, the support of our sponsors. Those people who have set, stood up and said we're, they're going to support the marketing community. Uh, we've introduced a new feature into our sponsorship thing where we speak a little bit more detail about each sponsor. And this week we're going to speak about brand recruitment who I very poorly drawn that pink square <laughs> by my head. <laughs> Brand recruitment were a sponsor from day one and they give recruiters a good name. They're good people, they look after you and they're based primarily in Cambridge, the east of England, do a little bit of London. And like, if you're looking for a job right now, they are genuinely there to help. So do check, take the time to check out Brand Recruitment. And I'll put in the follow-up email, a link to say thank you to Dominic. Please give him some love, he's a great guy. Just like me, he's quite recently had a child and, and uh, you know, it's just a, a, a brilliant person. I also want to thank uh, Content Cal, Pitch, Fiverr, Redgate, Cambridge Master College, Gravity Global, Third Light and Human. Uh, if you've got the time, please also do thank those people. So that's my introduction done. Uh, David, it's such a pleasure to have you here today. Um, and I hope that to start off today's session, you would be able to share the story uh, which you shared at the beginning of, of Do Open about how email became important for you. Yeah, I mean, well, thanks for the introduction and, um, you yeah, know, nice to be here. I mean, like, um, that's cool. Um, so, I mean, I mean, the backstory to, you know, the book and, you know, like email was we'd launched uh, a factory making jeans and we had a lot of publicity and um, we were getting so many orders. I, I decided that the most sensible thing was to go and close the website while we got all the orders done. Um, not a great decision, by the way, don't do that. Um, and um, while we went and hired a bunch of people. And so, I don't know, three, four months later, we, we got all the jeans out, we, you know, we, we fulfilled all the orders. And then I opened the website up and, and um, we had no orders, like not one. And I'd doubled the workforce. I had the salaries to pay in two weeks time. And I was like going, whoa, okay. That's a pretty effective way to um, uh, take us out of business. Most most people like spend a decade to go out of business. I was going to do it by the end of the week. And um, so I, I sat down and I had this moment where I just went, okay, like crisis needs you not to panic and crisis needs you to be really clear. And, and I just went and I, I looked at my, my time and I was spending 80% of my time on social media, you know, pushing us out there. And I was spending almost no time on our newsletter. And yet this so ugly duckling that was getting 20% of my time was bringing in 80% of the orders. And I said, well, all I have to do is spend 80% of my time on the thing that's actually working. And it was like that moment. And I, I wrote, I'm going, this is how we're going to set out the, the newsletter. I'm going, to, I'm going to have one for us. We're going to have a spread of things from tech, from business, all the things I'm really interested in. And, and we'd, have the, you know, we'd have the first page and the last page. And, and it, that recipe has stayed forevermore. And we just invested everything that we had in terms of time, because we didn't have a bunch of money, into you know, really like investing into that 
newsletter. And that newsletter sort of got us out of the struggle. And it, and then when we want to grow the business, you know, we just push a little bit harder on the newsletter. And it's like, uh, it's literally like, it's a beautiful thing that if you invest in it and actually give it your attention and your time and your love and respect your customer, you know, always selling, then it's the most effective tool that there is. And the great thing is like most people don't care about it because it's just not cool. And, and they're more worried about like their feed on Instagram. Go, oh, I'm worried about my color tones. I'm going fine, good. I hope your color tones are fine. Um, I'm not that interested. Um, and I just invest in the thing that works. And I've been on, I mean, I've had Instagram come down and make films on us. I've been on big 48 sheet posters for Facebook. I've, I've been on the behind the Mac Apple ad. You know, Shopify came and did a film on us. And those are all beautiful, amazing things, but they're, they're the cream on top of the cake. The cake is the newsletter. Amazing, thank you. Um, you mentioned there's a whole bunch there to unpack and I, I hopefully I'll do you justice with the questions and likewise the community, if they want to stick questions in the Q&A feature, they can. Um, but you mentioned time. And it's interesting that with Hyped Denim, then you found yourself in that sticky position. You know, you, you turned off the website and now all of a sudden you needed more orders in so you could pay the bill. And the web, uh, newsletters, for me, is an epitome of something that takes time to build. You know, the newsletter grows over the course of time. So how did you sort of gain that initial traction and those initial uh, subscribers to the newsletter that sort of meant that you could save the business, so to speak? Well, I mean, you know, like, we used it in the first instance going, hey, you know, we've got a short run. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody want to buy it? And, and lo and behold, that worked. But I also knew that that isn't the best relationship in terms of a newsletter. So w when you start to think about it in terms of like really think about it is the newsletter is a relationship. And so you're in the relationship business. And I always think of it as like a tale of two friends. And I, I have friends like this. I have a friend who, when I see he's calling me, I know he wants something. <laughs> and so my heart sinks and I'm going, oh, what does he want now? And, and then I have another friend who wants to tell me about this brilliant book or this brilliant podcast. And, and so a tale of two friends is like, when you're busy, who do you want to take the call from? I always take the call from this friend, but this friend can wait. And, and like people like have strategies and make things really complicated. I mean, if you only just think of the tale of two friends, you've got newsletters done. You go, you don't even have to, I mean, I would appreciate if you did read the book because actually, I actually, it's the, like I, I only like went and wrote the bloody book because it was all the books out, there was shit. I mean, I, and I bought them and I've been like, they have no clue what they're doing. And, uh, and, and uh, hopefully there's somebody goes and writes a better book and I'll, and I'll read that one. But I didn't want to write a book on newsletters. It was just like, they were so terrible and nobody cares about this space. You can buy books on everything on Amazon, but you've got some newsletters. It's like, it's like nobody, it's like badly photocopied books. I mean, it's like, like, if I used to collect beer mats, I used to send out these crappy little catalogs. And I'm going, nobody gives a kid. It's like a shit about it. I mean, is this family friendly? And I'm not supposed to swear, but, um, like, um, but it, you mean, it's like, that was the only reason to write the book. It's just been like, nobody, nobody seems to pay any attention. You can buy 10, 100 books on Instagram and all oh, like this marketing shiny tool and LinkedIn. And you just go like, it's interesting that, because it's not cool, like nobody cares about it, but I can tell you this, when you have to suddenly go and save your business, which tool are you gonna use? 100%, 100% absolutely. Um, it's interesting, this, this, this sort of tale of the two friends, because I, so to give context to the audience, then something you speak about and something you do is that you have two different newsletters. You have the Factory Talk newsletter, um, and then you have the Scrapbook Chronicles one where you use them in different ways. Um, 
And these are almost the embodiment of the two friends, right? Yeah, no, and it's, it's uh, the mistake I think a lot of people make is they try and go, um, oh, here's a joke, aren't I funny, I buy, buy my jeans. And you go, oh, hang on, like, but what, what we do when we're selling jeans, you go like, but would you like to buy our jeans? Yeah. I, I hope so, we make a great pair of jeans. So we're really clear when we're selling, we sell. But when we're sharing, isn't this a brilliant podcast? Isn't this a great book? You should literally watch this. It's the best thing. There's no conversations and it's all done in one shot. Okay. But people will try and merge the two. And you go, when you sell, sell. And it's fine. Give people respect. Like they're, they're busy. And they'll go, Dave, I've got enough jeans right now. I'm fine. And you go, it's good. That's, good. That's cool. Um, so it's kind of like... It's so much common sense, but I go on, like, as we know, I mean, common sense isn't that common um, because otherwise people just do it all the time and, and they don't. Um, so it's, for me, it's like fascinating. And, and the, the one thing that people do with newsletters, they start them and then they say they don't work and then they stop. And that's super fascinating. And, and it's really interesting that, you know, Thank goodness we don't judge an acorn in the same way. Because we put it in the, in the ground, you go, oh, nothing's happening. You go, yeah, well, yeah, let's take a bit of time. And, it, and, you know, like, yes, we were in that struggle moment and we, we, we did an emergency email, but we also said, right, we can't just do that. We have to go and you know, be useful. We, you know, this is a community we're serving. And actually when you go and like, genuinely give to people and go look like this this book is incredible you should definitely read it i think you'd love it people just go oh, okay i'm not trying to sell our book particularly it, it's just you go you want to serve your community and there are two ways to look at like your market i think you can you can do the you know like the raffle approach we're only interested in people who actually bike and, you know, like Simon, you know, he came down to the house before we started Rafa, you know, and he picked our brains, you know, because we'd done a company called Howie's and we sold that to Timberland. And we gave him a list of all the factories and told him, you know, what he shouldn't do and what he shouldn't do. And he did a brilliant job. But so he was only interested in seeing his customer as a bike rider. But bike riding is only one part of that person. So there's a 360 degree approach where you, there's another way of doing it going, why don't that person who's really interested in bikes is probably already interested in great coffee. And so you, you do the 360 degree or you, you go super narrow. And th th there are two approaches and both work. I mean. Absolutely, I love it. So that's, that is interesting though, because um, there's, you, you say when you sell a pair of jeans, you sell a pair of jeans. But something you're also famous for is like your storytelling. Um, so when you're when you're quite quite selling a pair of jeans, do you tell the story behind the jeans because that's really important? Or do you, do you literally? Yeah. We, we tell them about all the mill and then they, you know, their backstory, you know, how this particular denim is woven in such a way, how many times it's dipped. I mean, we buy stories. Yeah. And there are enough warehouses with jeans in and all in the world. Like, you know, we make one of the best jeans on the planet, but we have to sell the story behind that gene for people to understand why we charge such a price. I mean, you know, Rolls Royce make more cars than we make jeans. I mean, we're, we're super small, and but we just happen to have the best elite makers in the world. And, and also because we're direct to consumer, we can afford the best materials. All the other brands are looking at their margin and going, oh, we can't afford that material. And I'm going, yes, <laughs> yes you can't afford to be as good as us. <laughs> I love it. But so really it's interesting though. So when you say uh, I sell a pair of jeans, then actually even your definition of, of selling when you're selling is quite different to another person's definition of, you know, like we've got this offer on or like, it's three for two or whatever, you know, like the way that you go about selling is, is quite different in a way. And I mean, like, I mean, I think whenever you're selling on price, you're in a terrible business mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's miserable because the, the only way is down. 
you go, price is going to go down, margin is going to go down, you know, your conversion rate is going to go down, unsubscribes are going to go up. Um, so it's a tough business that, and you know, the thing that really fascinates me is how can you be like a small but remarkable business that also allows you to have a great life? I mean, we make jeans for Renny Rossetti. Um, you know, he runs a restaurant in uh, Copenhagen, you know, 45 people, but he, he also happens to be the world's best chef. So I mean, so I'm going, oh, I quite like that idea where you are, there's a lot of people like judge that how successful their business by the size of their business. And I'll be honest, I don't give a shit. So and, I mean, I'm terrible. And uh, like people just like, I upset the, the finance person in the business and I don't really care about numbers because I know I look at the numbers in a different way because I think if we're doing interesting things, interesting things happen. And so, oh, we're in vogue on Monday. Fine. Well, you don't have to worry about sales if that's happening, but it's only as a consequence of you doing interesting things. And so when somebody goes, I want to grow by 20 spent, I don't give a shit. I want my team to grow as people as creative people and that's what's truly interesting to me because i know if they grow a business is going to grow i just think we look at it in the wrong way i'm sort of bored with all this like growth hacking bullshit i'm just going like go and growth hack your team go and see if you can go and grow humans that's an interesting thing and and without i mean that is such an important point and i don't want to I don't want to denigrate the point by sort of not focusing on it, but you also mentioned something interesting about numbers, which is interesting and is also something I know you've mentioned in the past, which I want to pick up on, which is you have a team meeting every Monday, right? And you do go through the numbers. And within the context of this conversation uh, of email marketing, then, then what do you look at? Um, I've got a good friend, for example, who measures conversations. So he actually uh, measures how many people apply to. I think it, it's... We have a thing, actually, we have a Wednesday meeting, which I think is probably one of the most important meetings, and it's a creative breakfast, and, and people just share what they found deeply interesting that week. Um, and we used to have the meeting where you share as much as you can, and now you can only share one thing, and you have to explain why you thought that thing was interesting. And basically, the meetings train the people to find interesting things. So that's interesting to me where you go, when you come out of the meeting smarter because you're going, oh, I've had to explain why I like something. And therefore you're training your brain to go and find something. Um, so if we go and build all these newsletters and share things, uh, we are mentally more attuned to finding great things because we've had to explain it to someone else why we found it. But that's really fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, like, so, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, I mean, it's a very odd place to work because all I'm trying to do is grow the people. And, and so I will send them on any course that, I mean, unfortunately, obviously lockdown sort of stopped. I was going like, I want two people going to be a man. I want, like, I want somebody going out to the Lisbon conference. I'm just like, and the more I can get them to learn and bring that knowledge back, it's fine. People leave companies because they're bored. They don't leave companies because they want, they're going for an, another job, which is more money. That's the biggest lie ever, is they stop learning. Absolutely. Um, I, I try and help people leave. I kind of, I, I'm going, I want to, we celebrate them leaving. You go, good, next chapter, great. Absolutely. We don't have, like, we have tons of people who want to join us, it's fine. Yeah. Sorry, it. I'm going off track. Hello. Hello. Focus, Dave, focus. <laughs> no, there's some amazing com comments coming in. So there's Vicky here who says, can we all work for David? Um, and uh, there's a question from Will um, who said, can you uh, watch those meetings? And I know on Twitter at one point, then you were streaming those meetings. Right? I, I, I asked the team, I said, do you want to like, you know, broadcast these creative breakfasts? And they went, I mean, there's so much going on. They were going, oh yeah, maybe, but um, you know, because they're in launch modes, we, we're launching a collaboration with, uh, clown skateboards this week who 
um, he, you know, Jeff used to work with me and he left to go and, you know, start a skateboard uh, company with this unknown illustrator called Banksy. <laughs> and it was a disaster. They were bankrupt in six months because nobody knew who Banksy was. Um, and, but this time, they kind of know who he is a bit more. Um, so we're launching that this week. We're doing a bike gym, March of 1st. But we've made global films. We're doing animation and stuff. I was just going, luck. I mean, I know last year was kind of difficult. You know, kind of the, the whole world shut down. But I'm going, let's just do crazy shit and, and see what happens. And, and literally, look, we can't make enough jeans. We don't have a sales problem. I'm just going like, it's fine. Do you mean? We, we can't do an events. We, we don't have an event issue. We can, can't do events. It's legally not legal. <laughs> I, I, I can I can speak to uh, I can speak to this in the sense that one of the ways that or one of the biggest responses that marketing Unit has ever received was um, we sent out a cameo of Sean Paul uh, wishing the community well. Um, you know, at the same time as everyone was sort of doing those, um, you know, we're there with you messages and stuff like yeah. that. We got Sean Paul to do ours, and, and like it was interesting because there was no way on the email metrics or, or anything like that, that you would have been able to see that spike but in terms of reaction and sort of doing something interesting. There was, um, there was a moment of magic there. And I guess uh, to your point about doing interesting things, then that's kind of built the sense of momentum behind the community um, yeah. where it, it sort of becomes just really, really interesting. I want to uh, give people an opportunity to get their questions in because there's already a bunch that are open, um, which is amazing. And, and we've got a relatively short amount of time to, to speak about it. Um, so I'm going to take the second one first, which is from Timothy. Uh, and Timothy asks, what email software do you use? And I know the answer to this, so I'd like you to explain why. I wish I knew the answer to that. I mean, I kind of maybe, I mean, I know we used to do MailChimp um, stuff, um, and also we had a good relationship with Melchior. I, I was at uh, New York having dinner with Swiss Smith and uh, the, I met the marketing director of Melchior. So kind of um, had a good working relationship with Melchior. It's it's very good. Do you mean? I think we've gone on to various things. Like we we use Keep, which was Infusionsoft, but then I think we then switched to a thing called something. I think with all email programs, they have to have a name that you can't pronounce. <laughs> but that's a, like it's like when we in the brainstorming for names but like you just go we have to no that's too easy so we we now use clavio or clavio or and so in the brainstorming meeting go like that's really hard to say that could be the name <laughs> clavio clavio hmm. they have to say it twice so good you have to say it twice <laughs> you love it and um, I, I guess there's a second question on the tool there which is is the tool at all interesting to you? I mean, like, is that relevant or, or have you found it consequential at all? I, mean, I think it's, um, you have to buy the best tools. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if the team think it's the best tool, I'm fine. Like, let's just pay them money and it's the best tools, fine. I, we're not gonna get renowned for the best, using the best tools. We're just gonna use the, the best tools because everybody else uses the best tools, it's fine. Um, you don't wanna use the cheapest, tools that don't work that's just life's too hard mm -hmm. I mean, like i mean make it easier we we literally i buy everybody the best computers i buy everybody the best apple phones you know we've got these ridiculous apple screens that six grand that chunk i'm just going buy the best tools and get out of your team's way and and then there's a thing called um constant gentle pressure and it's from a, a guy called Danny Mayer. Um, but um, he runs these restaurants in, in New York. Amazing. I mean, when things open up, you should go constant gentle pressure with the team. You go, um, so every day it's like constant. No, we don't do like that. No, we don't do like that. Bam. Um, and not on the big things, but just like our thing of, geez, you you got to keep pushing the team. But yeah, give them the best tools and get out of the way in terms of the general having ideas. But like the hardest thing, you know, being down in West Wales, it's like 
you know, oh, go and get a social media manager. Like, honestly, down here, not so much. I mean, so you've got to have a, a thing where you're going to go and grow your team. And a lot of your team are not going to be able to say they've done it before. They haven't done it before. Yeah, yeah very true. I, I love that quote, you know, give investors, get out of their way. Uh, that's fantastic. So we've got a question here from Catherine, um, and I want to get through as many as possible for, for the benefit of the community. And Catherine asks, how do you go about building up your mailing list and encouraging people to sign up in the first place? Um, I mean, it's, I mean, most of the things that we do, I was always against. Like, you have that thing of, <laughs> uh, like, I mean, we had a guy called Hugh working for us, and he's going like, oh, do competitions. Like, I don't know, I hate competitions. Um, and um, and they work. Yeah. They really work. And, and so, you know, you suddenly get 5,000 people, and you go, that's slightly annoying, um, yeah. but they work. And, and those awful pop-up things that go and, you know, sign up for this. Mm -hmm. I hate those. They work. Um, but uh, the biggest thing that will grow your newsletter is go and put an incredible amount of time in it. Go and put an incredible amount of love into it and give it reliably at the same time each and every week. And that consistency and belief is the thing that absolutely will grow your newsletter. And it's boring. I mean, and you just go, oh, but Dave, there's got to be a quick hack. Yeah, I, I have no clue on it. No clue on any hacks. All I know is you turn up, you do the work, and people go, and then all of a sudden, in five years later, they just go, oh, how do you do that? You go, oh, it was a quick hack called like a decade. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I heard a quote the other day that fame takes a decade. And um, while I don't think we should all be aspiring for fame, then you know it certainly speaks to that truth of every overnight success takes ten years. It, like to be, if you think about friendships, they can take a decade. I mean, it can take one crappy comment to lose it, but but um, yeah, friendship can take a decade. Meaningful, I mean. And, and so you, you also mentioned the word consistency, and I think that's something that you speak to regularly, you know, you, you've been doing this for an awful lot of time. Is there a moment where you, you have an internal moment of introspection where you're like, okay, I've been consistently turning up, but there's something that needs to change here, you know, um, and there's something that needs to update? I, I think the thing that what can happen is when things go well, you you think you don't have to put as much effort in. Right. And, and I think that is quite dangerous. And, and so, I mean, the reason I've been like, you know, I mean, I, we were talking just before we started was, you know, I felt like, God, I, I, I felt like I'm in this shed. I did more launches than the bloody 1920s, like shipyard last year. And I, I limped over the Christmas line. I was knackered, tired. And I just wanted to spend more time with the team. And, um, but, but I also kind of wanted us to go and look at everything we do and then just go, right, um, we need to now push to the next level. And that's why we're doing the creative breakfasts. Um, you know, like, you know, it's, it's that thing of don't be complacent. And especially when things are working really well, you know, we sell out jeans, you know, up to, you know, like we send out an email, we can sell out in four hours and you go, oh, that's great. But we mustn't get complacent and so that thing of never settling where you just go okay what if we did this what if we did that um, and that's what i'm trying to teach the team and we have these clarity sessions we've had these clarity sessions like and they were 15 minute meetings and we're just going okay you know, what's the brand voice okay what isn't the brand voice what is the brand voice and you know suddenly the team are going oh yeah i mean you can't do any great communication without clarity and, and sorry, I was like, oh, no, I was complacent in, in, it was really clear in my head, but, but maybe it's not clear in everybody else's head. And then suddenly you go, they got, they got clarity and you go, okay, that's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that speaks to, that speaks to selling uh, a project. Uh, you know, so for example, I would like to start an email, uh, but you need to believe in me and, and, and this is the clarity, this is what I'm going to provide you. But I guess it also speaks to that team effort 
through the creative meetings that you speak about where everyone comes together and provides one thing uh, and you get the best of it, right? So. I mean, it, it's, I mean, it's always a team. Like the best thing about a business is building a team. And, you know, and watching people who perhaps join you with not great deal of confidence, not great deal of capability, and suddenly watching them fly is the best thing in business. And people go, oh, so like, oh um, no one's really, you know, like at the end of the day, going to remember you for how much money you made, but they will remember you for how many people you helped. And, and that is a fact. It's, it, it's like an absolute fact. And, and, you know, I got an email from New York today going, oh, I can't tell you how much you helped us on this course. And I'm going, wow, it's pretty amazing. I mean, that was over two years ago. Um, so I think that thing of like, I mean, I don't ever know who this rugby player was, but I was listening to the car and I caught the tail end of a conversation and he was a, an England World Cup winner and he was speaking to a, a journalist and, and he was being interviewed and, and he was asked the question, was winning the gold medal your defining moment? And he said, and he kind of thought about it and he went, no, actually my defining moment was being in the tunnel with the team before we got onto the pitch and we all looked each, at each other and went without using words, we all said thank you because we all knew how hard we'd worked to get to the point to be on the stage with the best in the world. And I was going, yeah, okay. That's, it's not the first time an English rugby player's maybe cried, but I mean, it's kind of like it was in the, the nicest way um, <laughs> as a Welshman. <laughs> I love that. And I want to pick up on something here, which uh, was in the chat. Um, someone said, this is turning into as much of a business talk as it is an email talk. And they said they were absolutely fine with that. But I think this is the key to email as well, that everything you speak about right now is, is moments of authenticity. And actually what you're saying is, is or the messages that I've received is that you put love and time and craft into it. You, know, it it's, uh, you put authenticity in yourself into it. Um, you believe in it and, and you do things for the, the benefit of the community. Um, I mean, it, it, it's not rocket science. Do you mean, like, just go like, the, the thing is, the problem with email is everybody wants to sell. And nobody understands they're really in the relationship business. And once you understand you're in the relationship business, and at times you'll want to sell, and that's fine. But as long as you're clear, and precise going to say I'm selling and it's fine, but you are in the relationship business and people don't understand that. They think the, you know, people go, oh, email is a great sales tool. No, email is a great relationship tool. And, and you suddenly go, the fact that somebody might actually look forward to your email means that you have respected their busyness by caring about them. And that's exceptional in these times. That's, remarkable in these times. And there's a great question here from Scott, which sort of uh, loops into this, which is uh, when you go out with an email, uh, you, you go out to a lot of folks. Uh, and Scott asks, how do you, and we're asking you personally, you know, you're not asking for the answer, but how do you look to best understand what resonates with your email audience? And how do you understand their interests and sort of make it better for them over the course of time through those relationships? Um, I think it, the answer is th there's a thing that actually when you are speaking about what is the most personal, it's at that point you start to open up as a human being and that's when you start to get interesting. And, um, but most people don't want to do that. And so, and actually what is most personal is most general and um, I mean, and, you know, like when we had to shut the factory, you know, when in, in the first lockdown, the hardest thing was we couldn't give everyone a hug. I, I wrote about that. And it was like, the people you spend every day with are your work family. And, and then all of a sudden you can't give them a hug. And, 
and I was hard. And and actually, when I was writing the email, I was actually crying. I was like, oh. I could feel myself. And people then said, oh, that email really touched me. And I'm going, it touched me too, because I felt it. Do you mean, and when you don't feel it, they don't feel it. The thing is with writing, the thing with anything is the transference of energy. When you give a shit about something, other people can feel that energy. Yeah. And, and leadership is actually, you know, like if you're passionate about something, people think, oh, leaders, because they're, like, they're entrepreneurs. No, it's actually they care about something. And, and they, they go into a, such a geeky, nuanced way that that is leadership. Absolutely. I want to um, I want to focus in on no, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to ask. Uh, I'm going to change tracks just a little bit. Um, so we've got a question. Back, I probably haven't talked about newsletters at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, Why the a... book? We're only number seven. I want to. I want to. By the end of the day, to be number ten. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I love it. Okay. Um, so. Let's go for the question from Baz, because I think it's a good one. So Baz asks, uh, email clearly works for you, but surely some email newsletters work better than other. Can you tell us about email content that did work and email slash content that bombed? So I think you've given one where it did work. Um, so you spoke with authentic authenticity about closing the factory, how you were crying when you, you, you were writing it, and, and presumably you got a response back. I mean, how about the other way around? Well, I mean, the other way is if your job is to go and find interesting things, if you are sharing things that they've already found, you are redundant. Because mm -hmm. the job of a discoverer is to discover. And so if you are not digging for the gold in the right places, or you're digging for the gold in the same place as everybody else, then your job as the discoverer is no longer um, you know, a job that you are serving that well. So, so I mean, that's the thing where the creative breakfasts have been like transformational in as much as people have to explain why they're finding something great and what it means to them. And, and, and therefore that diversity, even in a small team, you can have great diversity of people finding stuff. And, and we've developed systems to understand that you know when we bomb is because we're sharing stuff that they've already seen and, it, and it's obvious so you go like so you know like a newspaper can't go out and say the same news that i printed yesterday because you go well i've already read that um so i think that's where you know sometimes complacency can be harmful to to it and you know your job is to have a point of view your job is to find things and and you have to find things that they haven't found. So therefore they think you're useful. There's, there's, there's no doubt some people watching this are saying that you work for a, a sexy jeans company and, and you know, you, you've grown this amazing, this amazing brand, but they work for a quote unquote boring, you know, company, you know, a I, kinda, I, I hear that and I, in workshops and, and, I, and I've got a terrible retort for that is, I don't think there's boring um, products. I think there's boring people. Good. And because I'm just going, I, I was, because I mean, and this is a great example, but it's kind of funny, um, is there's, um, there's a ski resort that, you know, and I'm assuming it's in America, it's, um, it's not for snowboarders, snowboarders not allowed, it's only for the very best skiers, and, you know, the, the restaurants are terrible, but the skiing is great, and their slogan is, you'll hate it. And they print all the one-star reviews because they know that actually the people who love it, deeply love it and don't actually want to tell anyone about it. Yeah, yeah. And, and I find that kind of interesting where, you know, you go, I, I think you can make pretty much anything interesting, mm -hmm. but you have to come at it from the framework in your head where you go, I'm going to make this interesting. Yeah. And do you, do you, do you have a, a framework for storytelling that, that you use? Well, I, mean, I think, I mean, there's a lot of frameworks out there, hook story close. I mean, you know, you've got a, the, the mistake that most people do in their headlines or subject lines is they try and do 
all the selling in that. And the only thing that that subject has to do is grab people's attention. And it's got to be not clickbait, but, it, you know, it's just, and people just try and do too much in a headline, try and do too much in a subject line. And, and, and then they get disappointed. You go, no, that didn't work. It didn't work. It's like you try to say everything in one line. And guess what? He said nothing. No, I love that. And, and that's interesting because for your own company, then you've kept the same subject line consistently for an awful long time. So how, yeah. how, how do you um, how do you look to confirm that that's still the right thing to do? You know, and, and, and so uh, I mean, because uh, uh, those things are really about um, uh, you get rid of that. Sorry. Um, so those things are really um, you got to think about that as in, um, as in, like, if the Guardian newspaper is called the Guardian today, and then tomorrow we're going to go and change that a little bit. Um, you know, your descriptors, if you're going to use it, like the Monocle Minute, you know, the Scrapbook Chronicles. Basically, what you're you know, you're doing at that point is, you know, being consistent. And they know at that point is a safe place to get to. So, so that's the job of descriptor. Now, the subject line, when you're selling something, you can go and change that. And the thing is, the writing of hooks is a pretty interesting art. Um, most people mess it up by trying to, like, you know, use it only as a sales tool. But really, what you're trying to capture is a meaningful amount of attention without being clickbait you 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 know and clickbait is you can fool them once but you're not gonna fool them twice you're dealing with smart people um so you don't want them to do that and you don't want to play that game but it's a great art to it and there's all sorts of tools out there you can go and put the headline analyzer in and get a score of 84 and try and beat it i mean there's, there's a bunch of tools out there but the, the, the great thing with all these newsletters is like people just don't care about them enough and when you do actually care about them you start to stand out the wall street journal were doing a, a big thing on the renaissance of um newsletters and they interviewed us doing because they are oh, you're one of the best examples out there of doing this thing and i'm thinking we're in sleepy old west wales but we do pay particular attention to this thing um, and we did end up writing a book because all the others were rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> we ended up doing workshops because I'm going, it's really bad that like young people think they've got to go and raise a bunch of venture capital money to go and start a business. You could, there is another way of raising money for a business called selling. And you go, I know it's old fashioned, but you go, maybe you could do that. that maybe that could be fun. And guess what? The whole point of having a business is you don't sell it to someone else. So nobody tells you what to do. I like it. Yeah, no, I think it's the way to go. Um, you focus in on, on doing one thing well, and, and you said it yourself in, in the last answer that, uh, you know, people focus on your success through the newsletter because you've taken the time to develop it and, and make it something that you do incredibly well. Um, that being said, you know, you, you've also said in the past that you, you enjoy Instagram, Facebook, and, and the other social media. So how do you intersect your, your email content with the rest of your channels? Do you give that any thought, or does the newsletter I, mean, I don't, because, I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say this. I, mean, I, I, get, I went to a, a talk at Cannes for um, Facebook, asked me to come and do a talk. Um, I was really worried they were going to ask me, like, um, um, like how I, my experience of Facebook, because I, I, I mean, I don't even know my password. I mean, so it's kind of like, um, but the, the team, I know that like Facebook is an incredible sales tool and, and you know, we, members of the team know how to do that thing. Um, and I, the thing is like Instagram is you've got to, in order to be good at it, you have to dedicate to it. And, and my view at the moment is going, you can't put your attention everywhere. So you have to decide where you're going to be good. Unless you've got a big team, unless you have Adidas or Nike. I mean, and, you know, we have, you know, those people come on our courses 
you know, to teach them how to do newsletters, which is kind of interesting. But um, so for us as a small team, we go, where do we want to be good? Because in which case we have to be, we have to decide not to be good somewhere and be okay with it. And so right now, Instagram is not our focus. So we're happy to just spin the plate, spin the plate, spin the plate. It's fine because we're actually dedicating time over here. And I think that's a lot of small businesses, they beat themselves up because they go, oh yeah, we, we're trying to be good at everywhere. It's gonna burn you out. You're gonna get the Friday and, and need Saturday and Saturday to just recover so you can get back to work on Monday. And, and so you go be good somewhere because you can't be good everywhere. And then just decide, oh, I'll be good at this place and it's fine. The, the job is to be a skyscraper. So you stand out, bam, you know, maybe for a short period of time, you stand out and then you go back down. Okay. Monday we're in vogue, on Tuesday we weren't, and it's fine. Okay. <laughs> There's so many comments coming in from people that just like saying, preach, you know, and it, it's so true. You know, I, I think, that split attention is is something that um it's gonna kill you it's gonna make you miserable and bored and, and like you, know, you go home and really tired and you don't get any no one gets any satisfaction with being average in all sorts of places oh i'm average in lots of places good luck well done great life go and excel in one place and it's enough it's completely enough it's fun. There's a um, there's a there's an interesting question here, and it's slightly changing track a little bit, but um, it's from Katie, and I think it's important. Uh, and Katie asks, uh, the question that I want to focus in on is, what frequency of email do you recommend? Because I know that you've got a viewpoint on that. So it'd be yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, I mean, there's two sins, right? There's like uh, emailing too much, and then there's the other sin, sin is uh, like not emailing enough. Um, so what we try and do, you know, we do once a week, we do one give and then, you know, one ask, one give, one ask. And so, you know, we, we have a factory talk and then a scrapbook chronicles, factory talk, scrapbook chronicles. And, and we, we used to do like, in case you missed it, and then we just go and, and they get your open raise up to 40 or 50%, but you just go, man, like, if people are busy, it's fine. Do you mean, like, don't hammer them. And you go, like, um, I mean, imagine your friends going, in, in case you missed my last text, you go, hey, <laughs> man, you didn't get back to me. Yeah, in case you missed it, you go, yeah, I was having, like, lunch. Yeah. <laughs> Fine. Um, so, I mean, I think you just got to go, look, play the long game and, and while everybody else is playing the short game. And, uh, and once you start going, look, you're going to build a great business you want to have a great life. I mean, like the, the best thing you can do if you're an entrepreneur is be in charge of your time. Feel like no one has ownership on your diary apart from you. You decide what goes in there. You decide what doesn't go in there. And if you truly want to do something, you do it. And if you don't, you don't do it. I say no to it. Well, I don't say no. I just, I got 41,000 emails that I haven't read. I'm sure some of them are fairly important. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which makes me even more grateful that you, you uh, took the time to apply to this one so um but it, it is very true and i think it's um it's just one of those things that you find the space don't you you find the space that's right for your audience and, and so i know for us at least then we uh we send three main emails a week um, and one of those will only go out if folks haven't already signed up for a particular webinar just you know, Probably in case they missed it, <laughs> ironically. Um, but, it yeah. works. I mean, it's just like, it's just a question whether you want to do it. It's fine. Absolutely. I know they work. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. There's, a, there's a lovely comment here from uh, Lauren who says, is anyone else feeling utterly inspired right now and not now wanting to do breakfast meetings? And I think it's a great idea. Like, even, yeah. even if you don't do it for the benefit of the newsletter, to come together every day and share but some... I mean, there's a couple of things, right? There's spending time with your team and actually checking in and seeing they're all right is quite difficult right now. You know, like who who wants to be on Zoom less? Yeah. Okay. Who wants to be on Zoom more? Not so much. Um, and, and so it's tricky. But so if you can 
if you can teach your team how to think without teaching your team how to think, just because of the, the way you do things, and you go, oh, that's pretty interesting. And have short meetings. So the creative breakfast is 30 minutes and one share. And, and so, you know, then people just go, oh, yeah, that was interesting. And guess what? Really, people are really competitive. So they want to go and find something amazing. And so it's kind of like the, the antenna is suddenly, you're training the antenna to spot really interesting things. And, and it's, it doesn't feel like a chore. It's kind of like fun. There's another thing on Lululemon. They have this thing called clearings where they go around the team and go like, hey, how are you doing? Oh, you're not sleeping. You just split up your partner. Okay. And, and that's why I'm a bit grouchy. You go, fine. Okay. I mean, that's, that's something I want to do with the team. And, and we've, in our clarity sessions, that's the stuff that we're going to integrate into the team. It's just trying to get everybody back together. With, you know. And there's another thing that I want to do with the team, like just to go completely off the <laughs> chart, you know, is um, Brian Kurtz, who is a, a direct mailer, who uh, reprinted one of the best advertising books, uh, Breakthrough Advertising, it's 100 quid. You can't buy it anywhere. But you can buy it on Amazon for 500 quid. Um, but it, he told a story about you wanted to create a, uh, um, an ideas culture. Um, and, and what they did before every meeting is you had to bring two ideas to the meeting. And they didn't have to be about that meeting. Right. And, and so we go, I've had an idea. We should have more cake. Okay. Interesting. But one of the ideas um, was, you know, the lady in dispatch said, if you made your book one ounce, one ounce less, you save $300,000 in postage year. And you go, okay. And so that two ideas every meeting created because um, people like talk about, oh, how do I create um, yeah, a creative culture? You go, if you have to go to every meeting, you have to bring two ideas and everybody does that. And, it, and it's literally one, you know, 60 seconds. So you go, that's a lot of ideas in our company. Yeah. That's interesting. Absolutely. That's very interesting. It sounds, um, sounds very much like the meetings that James and I have. Not quite structured, but um, yeah, right. And then, you know, the one I always go back to is that we started out speaking about finances and somehow half an hour later ended up, um, we were playing the French horn. Um, you know, so <laughs> those, best, those are the best meetings. Yeah. Absolutely, 100%. You know, you know you're yeah. trying to build a good uh, partner in, in crime uh, when it comes to uh, those sort of meetings. Um, we're coming towards the end and, and David, I know you're, you're like an impossibly busy person, uh, not least with your 41,000 uh, emails in your inbox. Um, so I probably just want to give you an opportunity, really. Um, is there anything that we haven't discussed within the email sphere, which, you know, feels like a nugget, um, something that you're really pleased that you've done, something that you wish you would have done, something that stood out over the past, it was 2012 that you started high at Benham, so, you know, over the past nine years that you really, you know, really affected yeah. I mean, there's tons of things, but I, I kind of find it really interesting when you sort of, you come across some kind of thinking that you thought, oh, that wouldn't work, but then does. And I'm sort of, sort of talking in terms of selling the Do Lectures courses. And, um, and normally when we sell, we, you know, we do this long, you know, tell you, you know, in 27,000 words why you should buy this course. And then a guy called Joel Irway, he, he said, look, he came up with this, way of writing offers where you just go like, if I could show you how to spend $1 on Facebook and get $2 back, would you do this course? And that was his offer. And, and he went, it was kind of interesting that, and he did it in one sentence. And I just went, well, I'd be like dumb not to do that, right? Um, and that, I thought that was really interesting. I, I like it when people, do things where you just go, that goes against pretty much everything you, you've been taught and you know, like you've got to go and justify this thing. And these were expensive courses. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I buy courses like you know, um, other people buy, uh, I don't know, jeans, I guess. But um, I kind of, um, I, 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 but I'm sort of always curious about that. And the one thing you know, takeaway is like go and 
buy as much courses for your people as you can and they don't have to be related to your business that's the key thing people go oh like if you've got if you show interest in your people and you can invest them you know we sent uh, you know, the lady remarkable lady who does our production we sent her on a, a yoga course in new york you know pre-covid and people go how does that help the business well it shows that we really value that person mm-hmm. and and so you like it, honestly like none of it is none of this stuff is that hard it's just you've got to invest in your people and and if you invest time in your newsletter it's going to do better and <laughs> the trouble is everyone wants to give it to the intern you go oh we don't give a shit about that we're going to give it to the intern it's like um but they do worry about their their feed on Instagram being the wrong shade of green. And I'm going, I can tell you, this tool is more important than Facebook, more important than uh, Instagram, more important than LinkedIn combined. And, and the great thing is your competition don't care about it. And if you do care about it, you're going to win. I mean, it's literally, it's like, um, have a nice life. I mean, while your competitors are really busy, uh, you know, going, oh, I don't know about the shade of green on this Instagram feed. And I love Instagram. I mean, it's like, it just happens to be the thing that doesn't work as well as this thing. Absolutely. I love that. Thank you so much, David. I, I think there's, there's a few comments to expect here of I could stay another hour. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I'd love that, but I, I know that you've, uh, you've got some deep work to do. Um, so um, that's, that's, amazing for you to invest an hour in our community and thank you for spending the time and thank you all so much for your your comment yeah. about, yeah. uh, um there's already a, a chat message from uh someone i've lost the message i'm afraid but he just said i really loved chatting with all of you while this was going on as well yeah. I, I think it's been a real fundamental reset for me i feel calmer which is amazing yeah i mean and well done for building the community i mean like that, that's the thing it's like like business is fun. Do you mean it's like can build a community, like meet up once in a while post COVID, and you go great and wow, isn't that the best thing? Grow, grow your people, great. Yeah, you know, serve your customer, great. Let you look after your team, great. Yeah, you know, and have the weekend off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounds like a lovely idea, and, uh, and lots of sleep as well. If you can sleep, do sleep. That's but that's yeah. my answer. Sleep yeah. is important. If you know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so uh, thank you David and thank you everyone for being here today um, that was just lovely uh, I'm feeling inspired refreshed recharged relaxed as well so um, and to Glenn's comment here we should all meet for a party after Covid we will absolutely yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, thank you all for being here uh, our next webinar is next Tuesday at 8.30 um, please do sign up for that uh, it's going to be another rip laura thank you all so much for being here today um it's been a great one take care of yourselves and, and just have a lovely lovely